what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmaid to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Uh, can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah, all right. Yeah, good. If I get too close or if I'm too far away, then you'll have to gesture. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, it's great to, to be here to speak to you tonight. Um, <clears throat> the, for those of you who are at the breakout um, uh, session um, on that, that, that had a talk on brain death, you can leave now because you've heard the topic already. So, <laughs> I, so I, there's a risk that I'm going to bore you. I've said bore you to death, but that's not quite the right. <laughs> I won't bore you to brain death because I don't know. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, that's what I'm going to be talking about, which is, 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 is brain death, death and donation, um, and also it's an unfortunate, it's a rather um, morbid topic to be talking about after such a lovely dinner and great hospitality, but there you go. Um, and I also do have to apologise, I'm still on UK time, so if I start to fall asleep, in the middle of my own lecture, which won't be the first time that's happened. Um, they show me some indulgence and just give me a nudge to wake me up. So uh, my body tells me I should be asleep, but I'll try and keep my mind in San Francisco time. So I aim to speak for about 50 minutes, and I've been assured that uh, I will be wound up promptly and strictly if I go over that. So uh, I'll do my best to get through most of this. I may skip some bits, I may talk through some of it, read some of it. Um, We'll see how we go. So the topic is death and donation, and the question is whether it's possible to have a metaphysically correct, clinically relevant analysis of human death that makes organ donation possible. Um, and uh, the difficulty of finding an answer is matched by the, obviously the grave ethical implications any answer will have. So consider that the first human organ transplant was performed in 1954, and only a few years ago there were 120,000 uh, performed worldwide, there's no surprise that there's so much exertion by uh, clinicians and philosophers to secure as many organs as possible so as to give life and health to as many people as possible. But um, you know, there are numerous ethical problems to do with um, death and organ donation, but the problem of death itself and what it is, is I think the most pressing and being a metaphysician, I guess naturally I find it also the most uh, just intrinsically interesting as well as pressing topic. So we have the what's known as the dead donor rule, which uh, prevails in most countries, which says that vital organs should only be removed from uh, dead patients. So in other words, uh, removing vital organs must not itself cause the death of any patient. Um, but the problem is that the, the tension, quote, between the need for both live organs and a dead donor has required the development of very explicit criteria for declaring what's known as sometimes the moment of death. Um, and this, however, despite, as people have said, the absence of a biological basis for this degree of precision. Um, so the most common, two most common criteria are whole brain death and circulatory death, and they're both uh, enshrined in the Uniform Determination of Death Act 1981 in the USA. But there's a huge amount of disagreement uh, among clinicians and ethicists as to which criterion is correct and, and, and why. Uh, whole brain death still holds sway as the most favoured uh, standard, uh, but it's come under persistent pressure from critics, and the most notable critic here is, um, some of you will have heard of, uh, Alan Schumann, professor, retired now professor of paediatrics from UCLA, uh, and also another uh, writer, Robert Truock, as well. They have very different views about other things, but they've both been persistent in their criticism of the whole brain death criterion. Um, some of the defenders of the whole brain death criterion surprisingly perhaps consider themselves Thomists and hold that the test is consistent with scholastic metaphysics exemplified by Aquinas, but others have, other Thomists have rejected the attempt at reconciliation. So I'm not going to evaluate the whole brain criterion in all its aspects 
let alone consider a whole bunch of other criteria. I just want to exam examine some important issues concerning the criterion um, in the attempt to achieve some simplicity among all the complexity. Um, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, literature and a huge amount of sort of empirical and diagnostic information which is appealed to on, on all sides. And there's a general, I think, anxiety and increasing anxiety uh, over the lack of consensus concerning what death is, how it's determined, um, and whether a human being even needs to be dead, ethically speaking, before the organs are, uh, are taken. Um, so I'm going to make certain assumptions here in order to even get going, um, and that may limit the appeal of what I'm going to argue, but I'm going to assume that the dead donor rule is ethically correct. So removing organs from a living human being without their consent is not merely uh, as good as murdering them, it is murdering them. Um, I don't make a distinction between the human person and the human being, as some people do. Um, I assume a, a broadly Aristotelian metaphysic of the human being. That is to say that the human being is a compound of form and matter, where form is, uh, to put it neutrally, the organising principle that unifies matter into a functioning integrated whole. Um, I'm not, uh, for my purposes here, there's no need to assume that the human form, which I will also call the soul, survives a human's death. Rather, I take that particular question to be irrelevant to present purposes. And I also understand that human being is essentially a rational animal, um, for whom the power of rational thought is present uh, if it's a normal member of its kind. So with those assumptions in place, I'm going to set out the proper Aristotelian understanding of death as soul-body separation. Then I'll apply that to the idea of death as a loss of integrity. Then I'll consider the popular view that the brain is supposed to be the integrator of the human being, so that if the brain ceases to function, the organism ipso facto loses its integrity and is therefore dead. Then I'm going to examine, if I have time, the alternative uh, theory of circulatory death, which is the main rival to the brain death criterion. The idea of the circulatory death is the death of the human being. And I'll look at some questions concerning uh, irreversibility, whether it's necessary for death, whether it can even be established. Now, to give in the game away, as it were, as to where I'm going to be going with this, my conclusions are not going to be of much assistance to advocates of organ transplantation given the criterion that I'll end up proposing. But again, that's not my concern. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying that um, my proposal will rule out the possibility of future technology that can respect the dead donor rule and maintain a supply of usable organs. So death is the separation of soul and body. This doesn't imply that the soul continues to exist after death or that it does not. A clay statue ceases to exist when it loses its shape, the shape does not continue to exist. We don't typically say that the lump of clay has been separated from its shape, but this is what the loss amounts to. Now, a statue is not a substance, but an artefact, so its form is not substantial but accidental. And its form just is its shape. So neither of those facts are true of humans, but the general point applies. A form and its matter can be separated without the form surviving. When a non-human animal dies, it too suffers the separation of form and matter, but there's no reason for thinking that its form survives. So the death of the human being consists in nothing other than the loss of his form. So to die is, quite simply, to lose your soul. Uh, it's this loss or separation, I'm sorry, is this loss or separation gradual or instantaneous? Well, I think the answer is that it depends because loss or separation can mean two things. So loss or separation can mean the process of losing or separating. Or it could mean the outcome of the process. So I do want to distinguish, I may just use this occasion, between uh, process and outcome. Uh, the process by definition, I think, has to be gradual. Uh, being gradual does not entail being slow or prolonged, but simply taking place over some temporal interval. So most, if not all, of the cases called sudden death, say by electric shock or powerful trauma, are, uh, most, if not all of them, are absolutely gradual, yet relatively sudden by comparison to, for example, death by drowning or death by poisoning. Separation as an outcome, however, that is, um, 
I'll say a bit more of what I mean by that. Separation as an outcome has to be, however, instantaneous. Even without an underlying hylomorphic ontology, that is to say the organism as a form matter compound, it's hard to see how life and death can be other than all or nothing. So what could it mean to be partially dead? An organism might be partly dead, say by having uh, dead tissue or a tooth with, without a nerve in it, but to be partially dead would mean that the organism engaged simultaneously in the behavior of a living thing and the behavior of a dead thing. And if being dead means not existing, it would have to behave in ways consistent both with its existing and not existing, which is absurd. If life and death are all or nothing, then the obtaining of the outcome, the outcome being dead, cannot be via a series of stages in which an organism starts off alive, then undergoes stages of partial death until it is wholly dead. Yet for the outcome, being dead, not to be instantaneous, i.e. to be gradual, the organism would have to pass through such a series of stages. If not, how else could the outcome be achieved gradually? I don't think there's any counterexample to that claim in the case of a body gradually consumed by, say, gangrene or some toxin that progressively destroyed the tissue. That would be a clear case of gradual dying, that is to say, separation in sense one, the process, the process. But it would not be gradual death, that is to say, separation in sense two, the, the, the process, the, um, the fact of becoming dead, reaching the outcome of becoming dead. Um, I think we should agree with Alan Schumann's endorsement um, of uh, Bernard, James Bernard, who's a very famous uh, writer on this topic, defender of brain death. We should agree with his endorsement of Bernard's distinction between the whole organism and the organism as a whole. So the whole organism is one thing, the organism as a whole is another. An organism slowly consumed by gangrene is every bit as alive as a healthy one, the difference being in how close to death each one is. Dead parts do not of themselves render an organism dead. Moreover, this is just what we should expect from a hylomorphic understanding. An organism's matter is informed. It is organized, structured, and determined as an entity of a specific kind with a characteristic repertoire of behavior and operation. Given that what does this is a real metaphysical principle, that is to say, a universal form particular, particularized in some matter, it is hard to see how the form can only be partly present. How could it inform some, but not all, of the organism? Moreover, every single part of the organism, down to the smallest subatomic parts. If it did not do so, then we would have to say that the putative parts that were not informed by the organismic form were not parts of the organism at all. So gut or skin bacteria, for example, no matter how strong their symbiotic relationship to the symbiont organism, are not literal parts of that organism because they are not informed by the organism's own form. Moreover, denying the all or nothing nature of, and unfortunately I had to do some neologizing here, which I always hate doing, but um, I've come up with the term informance. Informance is what happens when the form informs the matter. It has a bit of pedigree, a couple of hundred years old. Uh, I can find about one or two examples of the term informants in older English, but I couldn't think of a better a term, so I unfortunately had to neologize. So, denying the all or nothing nature of the informants of the organism by its form is almost certainly inconsistent with the doctrine of the unicity of substantial form. For the obvious way of maintaining that an organism can be only partly and partially informed by its organismic substantial form would be to hold that some part of it was informed only by a vegetative or a sensitive form, sensitive form but not by the higher form proper to the organism. To put it in a non-scholastic way, the idea would be that in a human, for example, parts were merely vegetative or sensitive, merely animal, but not fully human, while other parts were fully human. This might be possible for some kind of freakish Frankensteinian creation, but I have no idea how that would apply to a real unitary organism such as human being. To what vegetative or animal kind would these partially human parts belong, biologically speaking? Their DNA would be human, and mere damage or malfunction would not be sufficient to deprive them of their human identity. So, taking the, together the idea of death as separation, that separation is an outcome, not a process. That hylomorphic composition is all or nothing. And that one clear way of denying it requires also denying the doctrine of unicity. 
we have a strong case for regarding death as instantaneous. It is not for nothing that the expression, the moment of death, has such a long history. So we should not misinterpret the Jesuit moral theologian Juan Ferreres, who in his important early 20th century work says the following, quote, in general, we may hold as universally admitted that death does not invade the entire organism suddenly, but only gradually. The separation of soul and body taking place some time after the man is usually said to be dead. We shouldn't misinterpret that, because immediately following, he adds, he adds this. He says, quote, that there exists a longer or shorter period of life between the actual moment of death and that ordinarily supposed to be indicated as such by certain symptoms is generally admitted. He then refers immediately to another famous, uh, a famous clinician, um, Dr. Jean Laborde, whose significantly, significant early work on resuscitation occupies a large part of Ferreira's book. Laborde himself speaks of the moment at which the spark of life is totally and finally extinct. So I think both of them take death the, the, the act or event of becoming dead as being absolutely instantaneous, even though the process of dying is not. So the immediate challenge to the idea of the moment of death as a genuine moment is um, uh, a question concerning um, the integration or integrity of the organism. So the challenge um, is that integrity or integration, I'll sometimes use one term, sometimes the other, that it doesn't look to be an all or nothing matter. And hence the loss of integrity must be gradual, and so it cannot be instantaneous. So death cannot be instantaneous. And this appearance is lent support by the ways in which supporters of integrity formulate the phenomenon. So uh, Schumann, for example, speaks of integrity as, quote, the anti-entropic mutual interaction of all the cells and tissues of the body mediated in mammals by circulating oxygenated blood. And you have other writers speaking in a very similar way, Nicholas Tonti Filippini speaking of intercommunication between the parts in such a way that the body remains a functional whole. And there's a kind of dynamic unity of the parts intercommunicating. And he notes that this can be partial. Um, and there are numerous instances of this way of talking of integration. But the point uh, is pretty clear. It's that if integrity is understood in terms of intercommunication or transfer of information between parts, the interaction of the organism with its environment and so on, it's hard to see how integrity has to be all or nothing. Not all parts need to receive all biologically normal kinds of communication. For example, a paralyzed limb will not receive nerve impulses and nerve signals might be present in some parts where circulation is severely compromised. Not only can integration gradually be lost, but there can be no moment marking the leap from life to death because there's no moment marking the leap from integration to non-integration. Um, proponents of integration as communication do not identify the moment of death as the leap from the cessation of the final organismic system or information transfer process left functioning to the absence of all such systems or processes. But even if there were such, the fact that the last system, whatever it might be, will itself not shut down instantaneously still makes the transition from life to death non-instantaneous on this view. Given this mismatch between the loss of integration and the separation of form and matter, or soul and body, to kind of the bio this biological phenomenon, the metaphysical one, it's exceedingly difficult to see how the two could be identified. Isn't it enough that they be coextensive? Perhaps necessarily so, in which case wouldn't integration be an acceptable epistemic criterion or test of separation? The problem though is that there is no reason to think that any particular kind or degree of loss of integration is the phenomenon whose coextensiveness with coextensiveness with separation is what we're looking for. And that is another reason for not identifying such loss with the separation of body and soul. Just what is the biological phenomenon that we're after? When we look for communication and transfer of information between parts and subsystems, subsystems why is this metaphysically important? Well, the answer on the hylomorphic theory is that these phenomena are marks of integrity in the all or nothing sense. 
The idea of the organism as a whole gestures in just the right direction. So it's not as though integration theorists are missing the point. But the problem is that they should not focus on intercommunication between parts, which is a matter of degree and comes in many kinds. Otherwise, there is no obstacle to holding that declining integration just is gradual death. Not just gradual dying, but gradual death. And that if enough, but not all systems shut down or stop interacting, the human being is not fully alive or is as good as dead, perhaps good enough for organs to be removed. But integrity is all or nothing. Either the organism is a whole or it is not. The concept of a partial whole, at least for organisms, makes no sense. When the body is informed, integrity is present and there is a whole organism. When the form is lost, so is integrity and no organism remains at all. This is how form works. Form unifies matter into a substantial whole and permeates every part of the substance. My big toe is as much me, as long as it's attached and functioning, as my head, or for that matter, my brain. So is an individual red blood cell or a single neuron. Form reaches into every part of the organism. If it did not do so, an organism would be an accidental unity. A complex of at least two substances, or of a substance and, an and at least one accident. An organism as a whole remains so even when it is less than a whole organism. Loss of integration in the sense of intercommunication should make no more difference to integrity in the all or nothing hylomorphic sense than amputation. Given this metaphysical approach to death, the concept of death as disintegration needs to be handled with extreme care. For we must not confuse the all or nothing instantaneous loss of integrity in which death consists with one or other process whereby the parts and subsystems, subsystems of an organism cease, perhaps gradually, to function one by one. Moreover, there is a third concept of disintegration which must be kept separate. Disintegration as the literal physical separation of parts of an organism. It's my contention that disintegration as systemic failure, that is to say the second concept, can only occur prior to disintegration as loss of integrity, which is true metaphysical death. Further, disintegration as physical separation can occur prior or subsequently to true metaphysical death. Epistemically, Systemic failure is, of course, a fallible sign of dying, whether or not the organism in fact dies. Physical separation is also a fallible sign of dying when it occurs prior to death. And when it occurs after death, it is an infallible sign that the organism has died. The third concept of disintegration, that is to say physical separation, plays a far more important role in the debate over organ donation than so far acknowledged by any side. So, the next issue then, having sort of set ourselves this kind of metaphysical approach to death, is to look at whether somehow the brain death criterion can um, do the job that has been asked of it in the light of that metaphysical approach. Um, and I think the most interesting and important version of the brain death criterion is, is, is via the idea that the brain is somehow the integrator of the organism. So defenders of the brain death criterion, the most I think, interesting and relevant uh, and plausible defenders of the brain death criterion agree that death is loss of bodily integrity and they said well that integrity is lost when the whole brain ceases to function because the brain is the integrator. As one defender puts it, without the brain the body loses its form as the parts cease to be an integrated dynamic unity. Or in less high flow in terms, without the semi-Aristotelianism, we have this quote, a moment's reflection discloses that it is primarily the brain that is responsible for the functioning of the organism as a whole. The integration of organ and tissue subsystems by neural and neuroendocrine control of temperature, fluids, electrolytes, etc. Um, this, sorry, this is all done, all of this integration is done by the brain. The cardiac arrest patient with whole brain destruction is simply a preparation of unintegrated individual subsystems since the organism as a whole has <clears throat> ceased functioning. So the idea being that once the brain has ceased functioning, what's left is just, um, as sometimes put, um, you know, a skin full of organs, basically a bag of organs enclosed in skin. Um, 
The inter this integrator theory, for all its prima facie plausibility, faces enormous problems apart from the general ones which affect all bra uh, brain theory, whole brain theories, such as the impossibility of determining that the entire brain has ceased functioning at all. Um, we need to know first whether the integrator theory is an empirical or a metaphysical theory. Is it that physiology teaches us that the brain is the integrator, or that we come to this as a metaphysical view from empirical facts about the brain's workings in respect of the organism? And I think neither interpretation, empirical or metaphysical, is palatable. And I think this is probably um, an opportunity where I might skip a bit of material. So my the section where I have this paper of empirical objections really um, is a kind of uh, development of um, recapitulation and development of, of what Schumann says. So um, Schumann, in, in a number of you know, extensive writings, has pointed out, empirically speaking, um, that the brain does not perform in any, sometimes it's any, sometimes hardly any, integrative functions, actually. But the integrative functions are nearly all, if not all, outside the brain. Um, and so that therefore, on, on kind of purely empirical grounds, um, there is no reason for thinking of the brain uh, as an integrator. Um, and he gives examples, I mean, these are examples that are well known to people who are kind of into this, this topic. Um, for example, a boy diagnosed as brain dead from meningitis at the age of four who lived another 20 years at home on a ventilator. Um, and uh, after he, he was definitively dead, an autopsy revealed that his brain was destroyed absolutely destroyed. And Miller and Truer put it as follows. They say that um, he had an entirely calcified brain with no neural elements visible, either grossly or microscopically. This wasn't some sort of epistemic problem that, you know, he hadn't been properly diagnosed, and so that's why he lived another 20 years. He was properly diagnosed, and he lived another 20 years um, on a ventilator. Uh, now, here we question myself. Well, that's a question, Becky. He wasn't. He was never alive. Um, but... <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he was brought home, warm, pink, breathing, with artificial help, um, and um, uh, he was revealed to have uh, virtually no brain tissue whatsoever that was left. <coughs> um, so, um, just to point out, one thing I will point out here on the empirical side is that uh, a criticism, there's an important criticism that's been made of Schumann's litany of empirical reasons for thinking that the brain is not an integrator. And, and the criticism is that, well, a lot of these phenomena, these so-called integrative phenomena that occur outside the brain that he refers to can also be reproduced um, ex vivo in culture, in tissue cultures in the laboratory. So that really these so-called processes that are supposed to be integrative but outside the brain are not really integrative processes at all. They can occur uh, in a tissue sample without any organism present whatsoever. So that, you know, Schumann, Schumann is helping himself to too much. Um, there are a number of things to say here, and the details are of paramount importance. But for example, if you take wound healing. So Schumann says, well, wound healing occurs with no neurological support whatsoever. It just occurs. The patient on the ventilator who's diagnosed as brain dead, still you cut them, they heal their wound, their wounds heal. That's an integrative whole body process. You know, wherever you cut them, they will heal. Cut them across their entire body from, you know, head to toe, and they will heal, or try to heal, even though they've been diagnosed as brain dead. And critics say, well, you know, you can reproduce tissue uh, wound healing, just do a little sample of tissue in the laboratory. Um, it turns out, actually, that um, uh, ex vivo models of wound healing require complex preparations for the tissue samples to actually be viable. Um, one study used incubation in fetal calf serum in order to see any healing whatsoever in the ex vivo models. Um, there's a problem with lack of blood supply and so on. So it's not that easy to just uh, even attempt to reproduce what happens in the case of a ventilator patient uh, in the laboratory. But the point is that such models as far as I can tell, will only ever be approximations rather than replications of what goes on when the organism repairs itself. The closer they get to the approximation in their approximations, the more they have to mimic or substitute organismic processes such as circulation and immune support. Um, so that's a kind of tacit admission that in vivo healing is a holistic process attributable to the organism rather than any of its parts. Um, 
The same goes for things such as sexual maturation. So there, there, are, there are patients diagnosed as brain dead who continue to undergo puberty if they're young. Um, their body keeps growing. Um, brain dead patients have gestated um, <coughs> children to term. Uh, these seem to be, by necessity, organism level processes. Um, so these sorts of things, I think, are, are, are insuperable, uh, at least empirical reasons for thinking that the brain is not uh, an integrator. But I want to move on to um, some theoretical objections to the idea of brain as integrator. So just putting aside the empirical stuff. Um, there's one extremely important theoretical objection to the idea that the brain is an integrator, one which is mentioned by Schumann but not exploited by him, and surprisingly so, because he's very acute in his analysis, but he doesn't exploit this point at all. It seems to me to be an absolute, um, almost a knockdown kind of point. The simple fact is that the human organism does not begin its existence with a brain. Neural progenitor cells, that is to say the stem cells which are capable of producing all the cells of the brain, do not even appear until the third week after fertilization. And the three primary structures of forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain are not formed until the fourth week, along with the spinal cord. Um, so if the human organism can and does exist without a brain at some time during its life, how can the brain be the integrator? There doesn't seem to be any non-question begging, plausible way out for the defender of the brain as integrator thesis. To say that the brain is the integrator, albeit not essential, will not do. But what would that claim amount to? If it's a non-essential integrator, so the, the old human organism doesn't have to be integrated by the brain, um, so it's not essential, but when it is there, it is doing the integrating. Um, if the claim is that a non-essential integrator, the brain is a non-essential integrator, then the organism can persist without it, and absent independent reasons for thinking this never happens apart from embryogenesis, the claim either begs the question or proves nothing. We simply have no good reason, given the clear existence of living human organisms with our brains, to think that whenever the brain is functioning, it is also integrating. Why should we think that? If the embryo exists, you know, for the first few weeks without a brain and is fully integrated, um, what, what reason is there for thinking, other than some sort of you know, pre-theoretical commitment to the thesis, what reason is there for thinking that when the brain is there, it is all of a sudden, it's integrating? On the other hand, the defender might make a modified essentialist claim to the effect that the brain must be the integrator when it is present and functioning. Now, what would be the ground for a modified essentialist claim? The idea might be that once the brain has formed, the organism has reached a certain threshold level of complexity that requires integration by a master organ. Again, however, it's hard to see how this can be more than mere assertion. What level of complexity could it be? The, the natural thought is that it has something to do with differentiation within the organism. The more the cells develop specific functions, the more the organism develops specialised body, or, uh, specialised organs and parts, the more complex it becomes. Well, suppose that were true. How would it follow that an integrator was necessary? Why should we think that the organism as a whole is incapable of maintaining all of the specialised organs and functions in a cohesive network of mutually sustaining interactions? In any case, the complexity claim understood in terms of differentiation is false. Even by the fourth day after fertilisation, the embryonic blastomeres are differentiating into the inner cell mass and the trophoblasts. If the critic objects that the trophoblasts become extra embryonic structures and so are not part of intra-embryonic differentiation, which is I think a specious point, by the ninth day, still well before the appearance of neural progenitor cells, the inner cell mass itself differentiates into the epiblast and the hypoblast. So in other words, my point is simply that differentiation, specialization, starts well before brain formation and continues long after brain formation. So we're still left without a reason for thinking that there is some special level of complexity that requires a master part to take over as integrator in the life of the human organism. Um, there's another serious theoretical objection which is briefly mentioned by another uh, Thomas philosopher uh, who argues against the brain death criterion, but it, 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 again, not stressed nearly enough. The question of what integrates the integrator. After all, the functioning brain itself has the integrity of an organ, so why does it not have its own integrator, some privileged portion of the brain that integrates the whole? 
The defender of the brain is integrated thesis can, of course, deny subscribing to the view that every organism, let alone organ, requires an integrator. He would be right to deny this since many organisms and organs lack integrators. Plants are an obvious example, contra some uh, philosophers who seem to think that uh, plants have integrators as well, but I just think it's a ridiculous view. Um, but he would still need to give a well-motivated reason for thinking that in the human case, where the organism does require an integrator, that the latter does not need its own integrator, by which we, we mean um, a master part within the organ. After all, if the thought is that the human organism is the sort of thing that needs a master part, because of level of complexity or some other special feature, it would be hard to deny the same of the brain itself. The problem with requiring an integrator for the brain is not primarily an infinite regress problem. I mean, that's been pointed out, you know, this, you know, what integrates the integrator, and then what integrates the integrator of the integrator, and so on. But the real problem is that it betrays a misunderstanding of the whole phenomenon of integrity. On the hylomorphic theory, every single part of the organism, down to its very cellular and even chemical components, is governed by its form. To repeat the earlier claim, I'm as much a human being in my little toe as in my whole body. Everything in the human organism partakes of the human form. And that's not a mere point about DNA. The brain gets whatever functional capacity it has from the very source of all other functional capacity in the organism, the organism's form. This is demonstrated in the order of efficient causality by the brain's emergence, as pointed out earlier, from the embryonic developmental process. The brain is as much a product of the organism's integral functioning as the hair that ends up growing on the organism's head. Every part of the organism is the product of a single developmental plan. As such, my view is that it's utterly confused to think that the product of an organism's integrity could ever be or become the producer of that integrity. That, I think, is the main theoretical objection. So we're going to help you for time. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, good. So that will um, give me an opportunity actually to... Um, actually, I can... Yeah, I'll get to the end quite nicely. Okay, right, circulation. I thought I'd have to skip circulation, but I'm, I'm, you don't want to hear about that, so I can't leave that out. So, um, I, I hope that I've said enough to show that the, un, the untenability of the proposition that the brain is the integrator of the organism. Um, and given that the integrator thesis is a mainstay of the brain death criterion, the brain death criterion is subsequently itself severely weakened. And coupled with my earlier, more abstract discussion, I've provided strong reasons for thinking that brain death is not the death of the organism. So in that, I'm fully in accord with Schumann and some of the other critics. Yet, what this has done in uh, some of the critics is to kind of push them in the direction of searching for a genuinely holistic criterion of death. So, um, and, you know, Schumann is subject to this as much as some of the other critics, that, well, you know, the brain is not the integrator, the brain death criteria doesn't work, we need something more holistic. If we could find an authentic organism level process whose cessation entailed the loss of integrity, we would have the empirical criteria that we were after. And it's no surprise that cardiorespiratory or circulatory respiratory death, as it's sometimes called, is appealed to in that regard. And I'll, I'll just call it circulatory death. There are versions, there is versions of it, circulatory death. So, circulatory criteria were part of the standard of death in most countries before the advent of brain-based criteria. Traditionally, loss of heartbeat, pulse, or breathing have usually been taken to be essential signs of death. Contrary to widespread belief, however, none of them taken together or individually were ever considered sufficient for death, not sufficient. In the pre-organ donation age, people were far more concerned to ensure that a person was dead before they were buried or cremated. Loss of sensation, lack of reflexes, the absence of spontaneous movement, and more extreme signs to which I will shortly turn, were all part and parcel of the overall determination of death. But, because of all the challenges to the brain death criterion, circulatory death has emerged as a standard of death on its own terms. As of 2015, nearly 9% of US organ donors were diagnosed as dead by circulatory criteria, up from 1% uh, about 14 years ago, uh, uh, from 1% about 12 years earlier. As with brain death, there is no test of circulatory death agreed upon in all details. 
Um, once a patient's ventilator is removed, their heart might con continue beating for 10 to 20 minutes, up to several hours. Diagnosis of cardiac death is given around two to five minutes after the heart has stopped beating. Rigor mortis and lividity, however, do not begin until at least 30 minutes after the heart stops, and that's a point that I'm gonna to return to. But despite all that variability, one might think that circulatory death is a more promising candidate for the physiological fact that marks the moment of organismic death. And interestingly, Schumann himself seems to think so. He considers the full cardiorespiratory circulatory system, not just the beating heart or the pumping lungs, but everything down to the last capillaries, is a genuinely holistic, irreducibly organism level property. In contrast with the brain, he asserts, quote, circulation does reach essentially everywhere and a few structures without capillaries communicate with the nearest capillary, capillaries by diffusion. And he actually comes very close to endorsing cessation of circulation as the biological sign of the moment of death. He calls it, quote, a probably valid criterion and, quote, an anatomical substrate that is, quote, close to the moment of death, specifying uh, quote, cessation of circulation of blood for a sufficient time to produce irreversible damage to a critical number of organs and tissues throughout the body so that an irreversible process of disintegration has begun. At the same time, he recognises, quote, that there could be many possibly valid criteria that a person has already died, but the closer one tries to get to the unobservable moment of death itself, the more difficult it becomes to formulate a universally valid and certain criteria. Now, there's a lot to like about what he says here, but there's also a serious problem. On the positive side, he adheres clearly to the idea of a metaphysical moment of death that is unobservable. So, uh, and that's, that's what I believe in as well, and I'm with him on that. He insists implicitly on organism-level properties or processes as candidates for a criterion of death. And his circulatory criterion is a far better candidate than brain death. Nevertheless, the flaw in his approach lies first in his appeal to terms such as irreversible damage to critical organs and an irrevocable process of disintegration. Secondly, it lies in his claim that there is no single universally valid sign of death, only more or less approximate criteria that vary from case to case. Uh, and he actually makes his position plain elsewhere. He says, quote, we find it far preferable to say that healthy living organisms are obviously integrated unities, that decomposing corpses are obviously not unities, and that there is a fuzzy area in between that is intrinsically undecidable. Well, the first problem concerns irreversibility. There's been a lot of discussion of this in the literature, and uh, it, it, it's given all sorts of interpretations, uh, and figures in most of the widely discussed definitions of death. I, won't go, I don't want to get into detailed analysis of the different meanings of the term, but my claim is that any relevant interpretation will either be inadequate or question-begging. For suppose irreversible means something as weak as permanent, where permanent cessation of function means that the function will not, quote, will not restart spontaneously and no medical interventions will be conducted to restart it. That's a sort of a standard definition of permanence. The inadequacy of such a test is patent first. The fact that circulation will not restart spontaneously is consistent with life, as any beneficiary of cardiopulmonary resuscitation will testify. Secondly, the difficulty of knowing whether something will not happen is obvious. The usual protocol for permanent cessation is two to five minutes. Yet, as is known from the Lazarus phenomenon, spontaneous heartbeat can resume up to at least 10 minutes following prolonged CPR, it's called the Lazarus phenomenon. Not to be confused with the Lazarus sign, if you, the Lazarus sign is something else. But the Lazarus phenomenon, the uh, spontaneous resumption of heartbeat, up to 10 minutes following prolonged CPR. Given this, if you will not carry out a medical intervention to restart circulation, the chance of spontaneous auto-resuscitation is severely diminished, and the permanence test becomes, as it were, self-fulfilling. Thirdly, why should it matter whether a function is spontaneous as long as it can be supplied for artificially? One might as well dismiss an amputee as unable to walk because they are unable spontaneously to regrow a limb. Why bother with a prosthesis? But suppose irreversibility is defined as the inability of restoring function with current technology. 
Such a definition is plainly inadequate. How could whether a person is literally dead depend on whether current technology happens to be around for reviving them? Are we to say that an uh, apneic drowning victim, stop breathing, being in exactly the same physio physiological condition in a world with the technology of 1650 and in a world with the technology of 2017 would be literally dead in the former world but alive in the latter? A person whose circulation cannot be restored with current technology may well be as good as dead or on a fast descent towards death, but depending on circumstances, they may literally be alive. If irreversibility is defined in terms of a lack of restoration of restorability of function with any future technology, the fact of death is held hostage to human ingenuity. To be sure, a person who is in fact dead will not be capable of restoration to life using any future technology. Only a miracle could achieve it. But they will not be dead because of this technological impossibility. Rather, the technological impossibility itself, along with the death, will be due to the laws of nature. So the question simply becomes one of when a function cannot be restored due to laws of nature. On the hylomorphic theory, there is no simple scientific test of this for living things. Rather, a metaphysical judgment has to be made concerning the integrity of the organism. Is the organism as a whole present and doing what organisms of its type essentially do? It seems that any other definition of irreversibility will be question begging because it will explicitly or perhaps implicitly appeal to the very loss of integrity about which we're trying to make a determination in the first place. In other words, irreversibility in the metaphysical rather than technological sense is a symptom rather than a criterion of death. It is because an organism is dead that nothing artificial, natural, present, future or possible can occur or be performed that will restore whatever function, including circulation, might be deemed as close as one can get to the moment of death. So uh, I've got 10 minutes left, which is perfect to finish off this last section. So now to get to um, my view on this. So my view on this is um, probably not going to be a particularly um, um, reassuring one for many people. Um, but, you know, I'm not here to reassure anyone. <laughs> well, I'm here to state the truth. <laughs> So where does this leave us? The second problem in Schumann's position concerns his denial of a single universally valid sign of death. Yet he recognises that decomposing bodies are certainly dead. <clears throat> I contend, given the above discussion, that only putrefaction, the physical decomposition of the body, can be a certain sign that death has occurred. Putrefaction is by far the surest sign that, as Schumann puts it, quote, the anti-entropic processes of the basis of life, unquote, have disappeared. Physical disintegration, the third um, sense of loss of integrity that I mentioned earlier, is by its very nature the manifestation of disintegration at the metaphysical level. The loss of organismic integrity that must occur if the form has been separated from matter. Decomposition involves both autolysis, which is the self-digestion of the organism by its own en enzymes, and heterolysis, which is the digestion of the organism by internal and external microbes and other, or and other organisms. It goes through several stages, beginning with alga mortis, which is the matching of the body to, to, the, um, to the ambient temperature, usually the cooling of the body to match the ambient temperature. And it ends with dry remains, which are usually teeth and bones. In between are various stages, such as rigor mortis, which everyone's heard of, the stiffening of the body, and um, liva mortis, or lividity, which is the settling of the blood via gravity to the portions of the body closest to the ground. There is, of course, not a sane observer, professional or not, who would deny that such phenomena are certain signs of death. So why should we not agree on those? At least the earlier stages, such as algal rigor and liver mortis, as the definition, as the definitive test of death. Such has been the practice in most cultures since the dawn of humanity. Of rigor mortis, Schumann says, quote, rigor mortis is a valid criterion far from the moment of death and therefore not a clinically very useful one. Unquote. I find this remark rather disturbing, particularly coming from him. There are two problems with the remark. First, what does far from the moment of death mean? Rigor mortis, depending on circumstances, can set in as early as 10 minutes after death. Now you might find that an odd statement, but ask me about it later. 
Um, it can set in as early as 10 minutes after death. Is that far from the moment of death? Well, it would be earlier than many other cases in which anything close to irreversible cessation of cardiocirculatory function occurs. Secondly, what does clinically not very useful mean? If it means not useful for knowing whether to attempt resuscitation, then putrefaction is eminently useful. I would not recommend trying to resuscitate a putrefying corpse. If it means, on the other hand, not useful for scientific purposes, then a forensic pathologist will keenly disagree. However, perhaps it means not useful for organ procurement. So in the mouth of many other writers on this topic, that would appear the most likely interpretation. Organs belonging to a decomposing body are of no clinical use whatsoever. I'm reluctant, however, to attribute this interpretation to Schumann. The entire thrust of whose writings on this subject runs counter to the eagerness so many clinicians and ethicists demonstrate in their writings to loosen the criterion of death to make organ harvesting easier and more abundant. It may be, though, I am not sure that Schumann is implicitly endorsing circulatory death as a criterion of death for transplantation purposes. Perhaps he would want to extend the so-called standoff period, um, that's the, wait, the waiting period before um, organ removal is attempted, to longer than five minutes. But then he'd be running the risk of undercutting the possibility of transplantation itself, because the longer the interval, the less likely organs are to be usable. Given the possibility, even with current technology, of restoring both cardiac and circulatory function after long periods, it is all but impossible to know what the standoff period should be. If I'm right that decomposition is the only certain sign of death, there should be no standoff period at all. My conclusion, brief conclusion, is as follows. Um, so in any case, there can be no doubt that as far as current technology goes, putrefaction makes organ harvesting all but impossible. But if it is the only sure sign of death, it is also highly likely that from the beginning of the transplant era in the 1950s, every single organ donor declared dead has in reality been alive and has therefore been killed for their organs, whether intentionally or not. Um, I once said this on a radio program with um, a, <laughs> a, a, a uh, transplant nurse uh, in the NHS in England. Needless to say, I wasn't invited back onto that program. <laughs> <laughs> she said, how could you say that? I said it. <laughs> Put another way, it would be hard to come up with a single case where an objective clinician could in all honesty, put their hand on their heart and declare that they were as certain of the real death of the so-called dead donor before them as they would be of a rotting corpse. I think that is important. My hypothesis would be false, were it known to be the case that organs have been removed from patients in whom decomposition has in fact begun, although not yet been detected. After all, autolysis and heterolysis begin microscopically before being susceptible to gross observation using either the naked eye or the typical instruments of the emergency ward. It is doubtful, though, whether any surgeon has ever let a patient's dying process get that far before beginning the process of organ extraction. Quite simply, organs need to be warm, fresh, and either functioning or capable of quick restoration to function to be usable in a recipient. In the current state of things, this is just not possible when decomposition begins. So does this mean that organ transplantation can only ever violate the dead donor rule? Once again, given current technology, I would assert this to be the case. So it seems, does Robert Truock, because Robert Truock, who is no friend of Schumann when it comes to uh, views on, on organ transplantation, though they agree on brain death, uh, Robert Truock calls the dead donor rule an illusion he says that it sustains the idea that, quote, a bright line can be drawn between the dying process and organ procurement. Whereas, however, for Truor, we should simply abandon the dead donor rule and ensure simply that patients are comfortable and do not suffer when they are killed for their organs, my view is the reverse. Patients should quite simply not be killed for their organs. I've enunciated a strong thesis to the effect that prior to decomposition, it is certain that the rule is always violated given current circumstances. But even a weaker claim is serious enough, that there is more than negligible risk that the rule is violated. It would take a whole lot of discussion to evaluate the moral rules surrounding the risk of intentionally causing a serious wrong. This is not, in my view, a matter in which double effect reasoning comes into play at all. 
The organ harvester is acting intentionally. The only question is whether what they are doing is an act of intentional homicide or not. If it is objectively uncertain, then how serious must the risk be before they may not act? We can at least postulate that the more serious the wrong would be, the more certain it should be that they would not be committing it. Homicide is the most serious natural evil a person can intentionally bring about. I would contend, therefore, that anything other than a negligible risk of committing it would be an impenetrable barrier to action. So until such time, then, as a way is discovered of preserving organ usability in people we know to be dead, in other words, bodies in human decomposition process has begun, a moratorium should be imposed on all transplants from all but certainly living humans who have both voluntarily made a donation and remain certainly alive afterwards. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I would like to introduce our responder, Father Michael Schuren is a Dominican priest of the Western Dominican province, our province. He earned his PhD at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana in moral theology with a dissertation by knowledge and by love, charity's relationship to knowledge in the theology of Thomas Aquinas and its implications for charity status as a virtue. He is director of the St. Thomas Aquinas Institute for Theology and Culture at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland, and professor and holder of the Chair of Fundamental Moral Theology at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland. So let us welcome Father Michael Sweeney. back in my home province, my home region, and to be back in my alma mater. I did my, I did, I was one of those who did a philosophy degree at the DSBT and a theology degree back in the previous millennium. <laughs> so it's fun to be back for me. I, as I get older, I realize more and more how much I owe uh, the professors who taught me at this August Institute. So I'm happy to be back. <laughs> My comments this evening, I've entitled Falstaff's Body, a response to David Oderberg's paper, Death and Donation. And begin with an introduction which I, we can call On Love and Death. And I begin with an Australian who also lived in Britain, Frank Sheed. Frank Sheed, in his engaging autobiography, The Church and I, relates how he once began a talk to a crowded auditorium by affirming loudly, nobody thinks about sex. <laughs> then after a long and awkward pause, he added to his uh, startled audience, people long for it, ache for it, drool over it, dream about it, but longing, aching, drooling, dreaming are not thinking. If this is true for sex, something is analogously true for death. People fear death, spend thousands of dollars to hide the signs of aging that are the harbingers of death. They often fantasize about death, heroic or dramatic deaths, and happily watch a seemingly unending stream of Hollywood portrayals of violent death by murder, mayhem, or mishap. But fearing, avoiding, fantasizing, and gazing are not thinking. Few have the courage to think about death, about what death is. Professor David Oderberg is one of those courageous few. And for that, we are all in his debt. Most of us, I suspect, treat death the way great musicians treat jazz. As one jazz vocalist 
paraphrasing Thelonious Monk, explains it, quote, you can't say what it is, but you know it when you see it. Although this is not a scholarly approach to either jazz or death, it is sufficient most of the time. Most of the time, we are fairly good at distinguishing a sleeping cat from a dead cat, roadkill from a dog that needs a little encouragement to get off the road. <laughs> and when we come home from work and discover that although Grandma seems to be sitting as usual in her lounge chair by the window, but that her body is instead stone cold and rigid without breath or pulse, it won't take us too long to conclude that she has finally and definitively succumbed to her many ailments. As these examples suggest, however, our facility in distinguishing dead animals from live animals depends greatly upon the time that has elapsed since the moment of death. But when we approach more closely the moment of death, things can become more complicated. Shakespeare understood this well when, in his portrayal of the battle at Shrewbury, he has the final soliloquy of the mortally wounded Henry Percy be interrupted in mid-sentence, No, Percy, thou art dust, and food for... No one doubts, not even Prince Hal, that Hotspur is dead. But Prince Hal also thinks that Falstaff is dead. Lamenting beside the rotund body of his disreputable friend, what, old acquaintance, could not all this flesh keep in a little life? <laughs> the young Prince Hal, however, will soon learn what the audience already knows. Falstaff lives. His death is, as he himself describes it, a counterfeit, a mere appearance of death. Herein lies the importance of the question Professor Oderberg pursues. In our complicated contemporary world, there are deaths that upon closer inspection reveal themselves to be counterfeits, to look like death without being death. So what is death? We shall return to Falstaff and his reflections on counterfeit death. But first, I would like to trace the itinerary uh, that we shall follow during these brief remarks. I shall begin by guiding us along the path of general agreement that we happily share in common. I shall then turn to consider some possible alleyways of disagreement. First, I shall criticize Professor Oderberg's description of death as the separation of the soul from the body. Second, I shall, I shall suggest a clarification to his description of brain death in its relationship to vital bodily functions. I shall offer a similar clarification concerning decomposition. This will lead us to consider some cases that should help us see uh, the import of these precisions for medical practice and especially for Professor Oderberg's final uh, conclusion. So, the path of general agreement. The first and most important area of agreement between us is our attachment to what it has become known as dead, the dead donor rule. Pope Francis expresses, excuse me, Pope Benedict XVI expresses this rule as follows, quote, individual vital organs cannot be extracted except ex cadaver from a dead body, which moreover, dead body, possesses its own dignity that must be respected. The compendium states this even more clearly, quote, the principal criteria of respect for the life of the donor must always prevail so that the extraction of own organs be performed only in the case of his or her true death. The compendium's teaching is a specific application of the Catechism's more general assertion that, quote, it is not morally admissible directly to bring about the disabling mutilation or death of a human being, even in order to delay the death of other persons, unquote. Professor Oderberg and I also share a common attachment to a, quote, broadly Aristotelian metaphysic of the human being, 
Although I would prefer to, to describe this as an Aristotelian philosophy of nature, rooted primarily in an analysis of the natural world of being in motion, the study of mobile being, and not the more general study of being as such, which is proper to metaphysics. This general Aristotelianism is based on an analysis of motion, of changes, both accidental and substantial, that become intelligible only if we posit the existence of the twin principles we describe analogously as matter and form. In the case of animals, this latter principle is called the soul, which can, in certain circumstances, I agree, be helpfully described as the, quote, organizing principle of the animal's life. We also share the view that the uniquely human way of being animal is as rational animals. With regard to Professor Oderberg's conclusions, uh, I share with him the view that it is important to distinguish sharply between dying and the moment of death. Falstaff's body is once again helpful in this regard. In Henry V, we learned that it was the innkeeper, Mistress Nell Quickly, who cared for Falstaff during his last illness. She relates how during her last conversations with him, she saw that he was near the end of life. Quote, for his nose was as sharp as a pen, and he told of green fields. And when he asked her to put more blankets on his feet, she felt the progress of his dying. Quote, I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were cold as any stone. Then I felt to his knees, and so upward and upward, and all was cold as any stone. She describes the gradual destruction of Falstaff's body in terms that anyone who has attended the dying will recognize, although perhaps with not as free uh, access to Falstaff's body as the innkeeper had. But at the same time, it is still John Falstaff. She speaks to him. He is dying but he is not yet dead. Later, however, death has clearly occurred. <coughs> Mistress quickly thinks she knows exactly when he died. He parted even just between 12 and 1, even at the turning of the tide. However this may be, Pistol says it clearly. By morning, Falstaff is dead. But what is this death? Death as separation. <coughs> Professor Oderberg describes death as, quote, the separation of the soul from the body. While at first sight this language may appear Aristotelian, it is profoundly problematic and is indeed more Platonic than Aristotelian. For Aristotle and Aquinas, death is a substantial change, which is nothing other than the destruction of the living substance that was the animal. The soul is not separated from the body, because at death, there is no longer an animal body. There are the remains of the body, but not the body. For most animals, at death, the soul is corrupted, and its co-principle, the substrate called prime matter, becomes informed by different, a different form, or more likely, by a collection of lesser substantial forms, some living, some inanimate, that go, up, that go to make up the loose collection known as the animal's remains. So the dog we see, the dead dog at the side of the road, we talk of the dog's body, but it's the remains of the dog. Humans also experience death as the destruction of their animal substance, but something remains, the soul, as an incomplete substance. Thus, at the Battle of Shrewbury, Henry Percy's soul was not separated from his body. At death, that individual substance of a rational nature was destroyed, but with remainder. His wounded but immortal soul preserved. What Falstaff foisted on his back, therefore, was not Percy's body, although to avoid needless paraphrases, he speaks of it in those terms but the remains of Percy's body. This is why Falstaff will say in the same uh, play, quote, to die is to be a counterfeit, for 
He is but the counterfeit of a man who hath not the life of a man. This may at first glance appear to be a picayune trifle, but it, has profound, it is profoundly important, and I think it would sustain uh, Professor Oderberg's argument uh, and the gist of what he's arguing for, that the unified organism is no longer there, uh, to remind ourselves that after death, we're not talking about a human body strictly, we're talking about the remains, the mortal remains of the person who was there. A dead body is a counterfeit body because it only, remain, it only retains the appearance of a human body. It is, in fact, the remains of one. Traditionally, we turn to the progressive signs that death has occurred to recognize this radical difference, and we've had some of them, and we can come back to that. But before addressing these signs, we should clarify what we mean by the brain. So, whose brain, which definition? Professor Oderberg condemns the view that, at least in his uh, written version of his talk, quote, the intrinsically vital functions provided by the heart and other organs are wholly dependent on the cohesive and regulatory functions of the brain. So he, he condemns that view, arguing that this view, quote, has been thoroughly refuted on empirical grounds, unquote. Now, I agree with Professor Oderberg's assertion if by brain we mean the cerebrum, which is that large part of the brain that contains the cerebral cortex with its two hemispheres and its multiple lobes. The cerebrum is that part of the brain upon which higher rational function depends. When a person's cerebrum is severely damaged, if he survives, he frequently will enter into a state of unresponsive wakefulness, better known as a persistent persistent vegetative state. So if by brain we mean the cerebrum, then it is clearly false to say that the vital functions of the heart and lungs depend upon the brain because people with non-functioning cerebrums can live for years. The problem, however, is that the standard that in many standard textbooks and dictionaries, at least in the United States, these books define the brain as more than as one influential reference source affirms, quote, the brain consists of the cerebrum, the brain stem, and the cerebellum, unquote. This distinction is important because as one commentator has noted, quote, brain death is used as an indicator of legal death in many jurisdictions, but it is defined inconsistently. Various parts of the brain keep living when others die, and the term brain death has been used to refer to various combinations. For example, although a major medical dictionary says that brain death is synonymous with cerebral death, death of the cerebrum, the US National Library of Medicine medical subjects headings system defines brain death as including the brain stem. So without the brain stem, or if the rest of the body is severed from contact with the brain stem, these vital functions do stop. So with the larger definition of the brain, brain death does cause the whole system to stop being organized. But cerebrum death, you can live for years with a, a dead cerebrum because your brain's death is still functioning. But the problem is in different jurisdictions, brain death is defined differently as just uh, these two uh, sources point to. And then our author continues, the distinctions can be important because, for example, in someone with a dead cerebrum but a living brainstem, the heartbeat and uh, respiration can continue unaided, whereas the whole brain death, which includes the brainstem, uh, only life support equipment would keep these functions going. And then he concludes with the problem that these two definitions are used in different jurisdictions to argue that in this case, the person, you can now harvest their organs. So there is a real issue here. Uh, but I would, uh, I agree that those who have the cerebrum destroyed are going to continue to live and can continue to live on their own uh, natural um, 
reflex of, of heart pumping and, and breathing, although they would need to be uh, receiving uh, nutrition and hydration, which is, gets us into another whole area. But let's go on from that to look at the question of the signs of death. Um, normally, there are the seven uh, traditional signs. Pallor mortis is not always discernible depending on the, the color of your skin or the hue of your skin, but it's the, the, the paling of the skin is one of the traditional signs. And then we've already heard about um, albor mortis, so the, the body becoming cold, rigor mortis, uh, the muscles tightening. Uh, Leeward mortis is a reference to the, the black and blue that occurs at the base of the body through the blood settling, putrefaction, um, decomposition, and then skeletization. So, with these different stages, clearly something has happened. A unified system is no longer a unified system. But what uh, implications does that have for uh, the conclusion that uh, Professor Oderberg makes? And uh, to remind you uh, how he states it, first, that only uh, putrefaction the physical decomposition of the body can be a certain sign of death. And then secondly, um, in, in concerning uh, the way in which uh, organ donation of uh, unconscious donors has um, occurred. But if it is the only sure sign of death, it is also highly likely that from the beginning of the transplant era in the 1950s, every single organ donor declared dead has, in re in reality, been alive and has therefore been killed for their organs, whether intentionally or not. Now, to address this and to conclude, I want to just look at some cases, some cases that um, I think point to ways in which the situation may be a little bit more complex. And let's look, for example, at uh, someone who receives, uh, who's a victim of a massive car accident. The mass car accident breaks their neck. Uh, there's a severe head injury, but also a broken neck. So what happens? The paramedics arrive, uh, and an emergency medical technician is on, uh, on, uh, on site, and they're gonna try to keep the person's vitals going until they can get to an emergency room. So they will uh, circulate the blood and uh, aerate it through uh, forcing air into the lungs. They get to the hospital, and they normally, in such a situation, they're not able to get a heartbeat. They're not able to get the heart going because that system has been um, terminally uh, damaged. They get to the hospital, they'll keep doing it, especially if this is a young, some, you know, a teenager who's been in a car accident. They will do everything they can to try to get the heart to go again. And uh, they will fail because of the massive physical injuries to uh, brain stem to the uh, Cord, all of, all of what makes all of the things, the systems that are necessary for these vital functions, both the function of the brain but also respiratory and heart. Uh, now, if there's a physician at the emergency room, he's going to sign the declaration of death. Now, that's a, that's a legal death, but still it has implications. It's also he's making that judgment from his judgment of clinical death. Now. In that situation, it doesn't seem to me that it's exactly the same thing as the other um, uh, cases that have been thus far uh, portrayed, because I think that in that situation, there aren't cases of a broken neck who they have not been able to resuscitate somehow recovering. Now, do we know when the person, when the soul leaves the body? We don't. We live within the signs that we can see. It would seem to me, therefore, that in those cases, it's not an either or. And I think a lot of the organs that are, in those cases, harvested, we're dealing with someone whose body is, from the moment of that, of that injury on the road, is undergoing the uh, signs of decomposition. Do you have to establish that? chemically, scientifically, on the spot. That would be an interesting scientific breakthrough to see whether we can uh, provide tests. I would imagine that certain toxins fairly quickly will begin to be uh, detectable 
So that might be a direction to go. But I think it's a kind of case that hasn't been covered, it wasn't covered in the talk, that I think shows that even if you do want to hold to the principle that you don't kill people to help other people live, and even though you want to use and respect the old criterion uh, that are sure signs of death, certain types of accidents that are fairly frequent and that are pursued with vigor by these transplant teams, um, I think are still permissible and have been, I think traditionally, now things are beginning to change and the pressures are, are mounting, but I think are often uh, many of the traditional uh, transplants that were done in it with the young who were killed in, in, in uh, traumatic accidents. Uh, so that's, I throw that out there. So I guess what I'm saying is, um, to, to go back to Falstaff's body, if Falstaff, some modern day Falstaff at the a modern day battle of Shrewdery were to receive uh, a massive head injury and uh, break his neck, if uh, some modern day Bolingbrook had his team of doctors there trying to resuscitate him, uh, I don't think uh, once he's declared dead because they failed to resuscitate him because of his traumatic injuries, that it would be murder to harvest um, his organs. It might be unfair to those who received false staff's <laughs> organs. He, uh, he might, uh, they might forever have a, a hankering after a good sherry sack. But other than that, I don't think we need to conclude that it's good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Michael Sherwin. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite Father Michael and Professor David Oderberg to come up. And uh, we can take now some questions, uh, questions of clarifications, perhaps, uh, either Father Michael or David. So, and we'll have microphones. Please use the microphone and then hand the microphone back to our staff. Okay, so David, let, let me start with uh, a criterion for death that I'm sure you will agree you know this is death. Complete vaporization of every cell. When that happens, you're dead. Um, uncontroversial, right? So let's now ask some more controversial questions. Complete vaporization of every cell except in your right foot. So I don't think I would accept the first one. Really? Because there's... It's not a sign of death, that's a way of being dead. Yes. It's a sign of death that you see vaporization having occurred in every cell. Yeah, so you've got to see yeah, okay. precisely what you're talking about. You would not equate it with uh, decomposition, right? There's nothing to inspect, right? No, so there's, there's, there's gas. Something. The gas. Yeah. A sign that some, someone has died. Yeah. Right, so it's a sign, right? That they, that yeah. they, they, they've turned to gas. You might as well say being flattened by a car. You know, what is the, the sign of the sign? Sure, of being sure. It's so there are many such signs, right? It's, it's not a sign, it's a way of being dead. It's not a sign of death in a way that decomposition is a sign of death. Something different. It's not now that, you know, well. Let's push a little bit more on this. So now, vaporization of everything but the right foot. Now, there is no putrefaction in the right foot at the moment, uh, you know, for the next couple of minutes after everything else has been vaporized. There is still. Good, mud, good tone in the skin and so on for a little bit. But I think there's a pretty good case to be made that you're dead when you're, everything but your right foot is vaporized. After all, if you're not, then you also would not be dead if both of your feet were all that was left, but then you would be a scattered individual and that would be very weird. So, and, and they keep on drawing the line up and up in the body. Vaporization of everything above the knees. Vaporization of everything above the waist, vaporization everything above the stomach, all the way up to vaporization everything above my skull. The last one obviously is not a, a sure sign of death. Um, is, is, is there some place in there where you'd say, we stop having sure signs of death, and we, or we, we stop having situations where we can be sure that death has occurred? And, and if so, where is it? Sorry, say the last, say the last bit again? Where, where, where in that sort of cutting yeah. lines of vaporization can we say, 
thinking, okay, I'm sure that if, if I'm vaporized from above this, or above this, then I'm sure that's dead, but I'm not sure if it's a, a little higher. Now, maybe vague graph, but I'm just sort of trying to get a picture of where you think. Yeah, it would just be... So, you, so you're obviously not sure that vaporization from the neck <coughs> up would be dead. Vaporization from the neck up. Because that's basically brain death, right? No, that's not brain death. Whole brain that's, death. That's Whole brain death plus some extra stuff. No, vaporization the from the head up is the disappearance of your head. It's not brain <laughs> <laughs> So your, your brain's dead. I mean, it's this your your brain is not dead. Your brain is gone. Well, that's what death is. I mean, no, you know, death is it's just like your thumb bad. is cut off. When your thumb's cut off, it's gone. Right? I mean, that's the Aristotelian part. Brain right? death is not the same as brain disappearance. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, really? Yeah, that's the Aristotelian picture, right? The cut, off, the, the cut off thumb. The cut off thumb is a no, thing name the, alone. The I, I vaporized you from the neck up, and the pathologist writes on the death certificate, it was a you know, brain death. <laughs> yeah. I think I would be, put it this way, I think it was slightly misleading. It's slightly misleading. Yeah. Thank but you. I mean, Thank you. No, but I mean, just no, look, I'm not, I'm being a bit facetious, but I, I take the point you're making. Look, I mean, in answer to those sorts of questions, I guess my, I would only give a very general response, which is that you know, you're looking for bodily, you're looking for bodily integrity, right? You're looking for, uh, well, you're looking for the integrity of the organism. That's what you're looking for. Now, all I've said is the future action is a sure sign of that. I didn't say. Is it the only one? Uh, uh, well, I can't remember what the exact word. The, the only sure. I don't know. The only sure sign of dead. I can't. Sorry, I'd have to check my exact wording. But um, it, you know, I'm thinking. I'm not thinking of kind of exotic cases. But I'm thinking of you know where you have the body. And you know, otherwise I could have just said, well, uh, yeah, there are numerous infallible signs of death. Uh, road traffic, you know, being run over by a tractor, you know, being blasted apart by Martians. That's not what we're after, right? We're after um, the we're after the sign of uh, loss of integrity of an organism, which is a kind of point about metaphysical point about what is the case in every dead individual. Now, in the case of vaporized bits and so on, it's tr still true, loss of integrity. You know, vaporization entails loss of integrity. Where from? Well, I don't know. Uh, the, you know, the, yeah, head up, I'd say so, but uh, shoulders up. But, but that's it's not really a, a crucial to the metaphysical point about where it has to be. It's just that in all of these cases, you will find loss of integrity. Now, I agree, in all these cases, well, in all these cases, you'll find putrefaction as well. I mean, in the sense that, you know, yeah, there'll be a sort of few milliseconds. I can assure you the separated for, you know, to make right that, that foot's going to start rolling pretty quickly. But, so I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's always what we're looking for is loss of integrity. And I'm thinking of just the normal, non-exotic case as to what the sign of, of loss of integrity would be for the putrefaction of the organism. On the assumption there's a body present, that's not dealing with cases where there's no body present or half a body present, and so on. So I think I can incorporate your concern, but not in a way that kind of undermines my overall general point. Is really well. so. Thank you. Uh, one question here. By the way, we have only seven minutes left, so uh, because our, our buses have to leave contractually. We have, we have 15. Uh, this, this will be a quick question. We have 14. 15. 14. This is a quick question for Father Sherwood. So, Father, worried about conflating the certainty of death with death, right? So, here's another case where it might be certain that somebody's going to die because there's just no coming back from it. Um, any recorded cases, massive dose of radiation. Nobody comes back from that. Um, but death might take a week, maybe maybe even longer. And so I'm wondering if you think, right, well, so if someone receives a massive dose of radiation, can we start harvesting their, their organs? Because nobody comes back from that. Well, I, I mean, I don't see the parallel between what I was arguing. First of all, massive dose of radiation will destroy pretty much anything that you might want to harvest. So the case is a, is one of the ones that I'm not. We want to. What I think what you're wanting to formulate is, apart from having a definitive sign of when the substance has been corrupted, can we ever? 
um, harvest organs? That seems to be the question. And that seems to be the whole, the question is the nub of the whole issue. And the, uh, there is, I agree with, the, and this has been long practice, uh, one of the reasons why uh, priests will often, within a, if they get to an accident within a short period of time, even though the, uh, the team has stopped trying to revive the massively uh, injured person, will still anoint the person, is we don't really know when the, uh, the soul has, and we, we have to speak now in terms that we don't know what we're talking about, because it's all by analogy, departed, right? Now, um, all of our notion of going from point A to point B is through local motion, but the soul, the dead soul has no extension. So what it means for the soul to depart is unknown to us. It's just by analogy that something like that has to occur. All right, we don't know when that's gonna occur. Even after the, the, the people on the roadside have stopped trying to save the person, the priest will then often, no matter what, you know, if it's been 10 minutes, will still anoint the person because we don't know. Now, does that mean that it is would be ethically un, uh, inadmissible in people who have been so uh, dramatically uh, and definitively killed, they're not coming back because of their physical injuries, to uh, start to harvest their organs? I think it's an open question, and I think it, would, it is not uh, helpful to describe these acts as murder, since they've already, through just the normal prudential judgments of experience, been declared dead, because we can't bring them back. We cannot get the vital signs to work again. And um, now, I can, I can foresee, though, a situation where it, the, the assaults on life become so terrible that for prudential reasons, we don't want to harvest organs in those situations. But that's a different issue. Right? The issue really is in terms of objectively, would it be an act of murder to harvest the organs of someone who has been in a massive uh, car accident where it is, it is impossible because of the separation between the brain stem and uh, heart and lung uh, for this person to recover and we aren't able to reestablish any of these things. Um, I'm not willing to say that that's murder. Is it, should it be permissible? I bring it up. I think it's a different case than the other cases that I've experienced that clearly are a form of or harvesting organs from people who are still alive. The, the criteria, there's, we, we share a lot more in terms of most cases agreement with regard to the way in which the cerebrum brainstem a definition of death is used often to the heart and lung are functioning and harvesting the organ in those situations, I think is profoundly immoral. But I think there are a lot of accident situations where that's just simply not the case. And I, I would not want to call those murders. So two things. Uh, one about something that um, Dr. Sherman said earlier, which I do want to address, but firstly on this point, so the book that I recommend everyone read, you can get it off um, archive.org, is uh, if you're interested in the topic is by Juan Ferreira, is called Death Real and Apparent in Relation to the Sacraments. And his point in writing the book was not because he had a sort of morbid fascination with death or some interest in Aristotelian metaphysics, but to point out that for uh, ministers of the sacraments, that um, in the cases in which one might think that it was uh, okay to just accept that the person was dead, even though they were warm, pink, um, circulating blood and breathing, albeit with artificial means, which is to me is absolutely neither here nor there, that there had to be a reasonable doubt as to whether that person was really dead. And that uh, if you, and the question has to be not, the question is simply, you know, is this person dead or not? Uh, and the supplementary question to that is, do I have any sort of doubt as to whether this person might actually be alive? And his recommendation is always in such cases to perform conditional administration of the sacraments. So the formula is always CVV Sego Te Baptizo, for example. Um, and if you think that that person right in front of you who's, you know, cere cerebellum has stopped working and they're on a ventilator and so on, and you think that they're dead, then you have to be able to put your hand on your heart and say, right, it's too late to baptize them. 
um, and so walk away. Now, I don't think any kind of responsible um, responsible minister would, uh, for sacraments would um, do that or should do that. They would have to administer conditional the sacraments conditionally, meaning, and that is a sign of having a doubt, a real doubt as to whether that person um, is actually dead. And if you have that doubt, then you know that that really makes my point is that um, you know there is a real question. Um, I would go further and say, you know, in, in such cases, the person is obviously alive. But then, you know, Father Ferreras didn't have to deal with these kind of complicated technological cases. Now he was dealing with cases of drowning, asphyxiation, children born prematurely. Who, uh, you know, uh, some people would be, you know, saying, oh, the baby's dead, bury it, and, and so on. And you know, the question of, well, should this baby be baptized, and so on. So, so you know, you have to. Ask yourself the hard question, is this person dead? Am I prepared to walk away and not administer the sacraments to this person? Because you cannot baptise a dead person unless you're a Mormon. So, um, um, which is why they're the fastest growing church in the world. Um, as I pointed out to a neighbour of mine once, he was not invited around again for dinner. Um, so, you know, you have to ask that metaphysical question. There's no ducking it. You can't sort of say, oh, Prudentially, well, it's not the sort of thing that one ought to do in these circumstances, or it might set by a bad example, or it might encourage bad practices, and so on. You have to ask yourself the questions whether you think this person is dead. And I defy anyone to say that people who are whole brain dead, at least in the sense that the whole everything is not working, as in the cases you were saying, but yet they're, 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 they have a vent, you know, they're on a ventilator and they're warm and pink with a pulse, and you cut them and they bleed and they try to heal, you know, all of that. That turns out that person really is, is dead. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yes. In the so, back there? Me. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, not me. Yeah, let's, let's oh, hear from the person in the back, please, first. Fine. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I just want to formulate this in, in uh, ordinary terms of uh, moral philosophy. So my, my concern about this business that someone, and, and it's, it's congruent with uh, uh, your point, uh, uh, Professor Oberg, about uh, the criteria needing to be whether this being is dead, whether this person is dead. My concern about this business that we know the person is not coming back, I think it's best, for, it's best formulated in simply classical um, philosophical terms about the nature of action and it, it seems to me comparable to the business that one sees more clearly in the case of um, Ronheimer, Father Ronheimer, who argued that in the case of craniotomy that since one knows that the fetus is going to die anyway, it is impossible to kill it. And, and I, that seemed to be simply counterfactual in the same way that a prisoner, someone who's taken prisoner may be bleeding to death. And the person who's taken in prisoner can get an order from his commander saying, shoot him in the head. All right? And if you can, you can kill somebody who is dying and not coming back. So if you can, in fact, kill somebody who's dying and not coming back, it seems the objectum is not... Um, it had better be capital punishment, okay, so or yeah, just war. Right. But it's not a medical act, then, is it? Okay, I got the I got the point. I think uh, it's a very good one. But let's let's push it. Let's say um, you know we they bring back the um, the first republic and they bring back the guillotine. At what point after um, you know after Marie Antoinette has been decapitated? Are you willing to say she's dead? Well, I think, again, putrefaction is pretty good. Uh, uh, in other words, I, we don't know the exact moment. And the thing that is concerning about trying to find that moment is that frequently it seems to be, and it's not in your case, you're, you're, you're straining to, to, to find the limits of the map. And I think it's important to do what you've done to find the limits. But uh, frequently, the, the motivating factor seems to be we have to know the exact moment because that way, on this side of that moment, we can harvest organs. But since we don't know the exact moment, we have to 
we have to take signs, which we know to be sure. And it seems to me that if the humanum is important enough, we insist on those signs even when, in terms of ordinary utility, we pay a price for it. Yeah, I think that's a very well state, states what the, the, uh, the good that both Professor Oderberg and I would agree we're trying to preserve. The question is uh, how to read the signs and what is a sufficient sign to be something that you can act from. And I think that's where more discussion needs to be given. And I also think you can reach a conclusion as to one you might be able to read the conclusion that this is a sufficient sign, but because of the context in which we live, it's better not to act from that. And that's another issue. These prudential judgments are very, very difficult. Just because someone, we can arrive morally at the judgment that this person is dead, we can also arrive at the moral judgment that in this situation we still, because of the danger of trying to become the lord of life instead of the stewards of life, um, promote a society that is unhealthy. Um, but I, I think this is, you, I think you put your finger on it with that last comment, and it's, it's what we share in common, that same uh, concern. But the question is how to read the signs and what constitutes a sign. May, may I ask just a brief technical question of both of you? Uh, you mentioned, Father Michael, that the, the death of the brainstem totally is a, uh, it, were you saying it's, it's a sure sign of death or a sure sign that death will ensue later? And the reason I ask is that I recollect in one of Schumann's essays, I forget which one, he says selective lesion of the brainstem uh, isn't sufficient even to say that consciousness is gone because it's been restored artificially in certain cases with electrical stimulation. No, uh, the I, was, I was just responding to the claim that, um, that with brain death, uh, the, the claim that the brain does not have a regulatory function, or however we want to describe it, um, integrating function with the, the vital re reflex actions like heart and, and lung. Uh, it is true that the cerebrum, the higher brain, that is often used for certain definitions of brain death, uh, that that part of the brain can be destroyed and the person will still have all of the activities. But with the destruction of the brainstem, that is not the case. So that the person will stop breathing and will their heart will stop. And it, it's it, you can to assert you can artificially keep circulating the blood, but you're not going to be able to artificially get that heart going. Thank you. I mean, there's a slight difference. So, so, so Schumann's point, as I understand it, I have to go back to the papers to look at all the detail because he does go into quite interesting and minute detail about this. But his point is that um, if you think of respiration as simply, you know, pumping the lungs full of air, then um, you're having a too, you have a too narrow view of what, uh, sorry, of respiration is the pumping of the lungs full of air. You have a too narrow, narrow view of what respiration actually is. It's a whole body phenomenon involving gas exchanges between different parts of the capillaries, different parts of the body, and, and, and so on. There's a whole lot going on in respiration, only part of which is the kind of bellows action of the lungs. Um, and that even in the case of brainstem death, uh, you know, all of this can be maintained um, uh, as a whole phenomenon, a whole body phenomenon by artificial means. But the fact that it's artificial is irrelevant. The fact that the brain is the normal means by which <coughs> this process is, is maintained is, um, you know, itself interesting but not metaphysically uh, crucial. Unlike, for example, speech, right? So, you know, your brain is completely calcified and destroyed. There's no way of artificially producing speech that we're, that we're aware of. Um, uh, and that is a brain-mediated function in the, in the kind of really absolute sense, right? Speech and, and thought and so on, but that, that is a brain-mediated function. But the respiration is, is more complicated than that. It's not just uh, simply, you know, the pumping of the lungs. It's a whole body phenomenon.